like many of you, my life has been shaped by the internet. About eight years ago, I met my now husband on Craigslist. He had an extra room in his house, and I moved in. And for the last 15 years, I've worked with my family to run the first internet paid newsletter, as well as to host a conference dedicated to understanding the future of technology. And last year, my Craigslist husband and I started a company by raising money through strangers that we met through Craigslist, or sorry, Kickstarter. Uh, so today, I'm here to talk about something a little different. I'm here, standing here in front of you to warn you about the threat that the internet holds for democracy. And if you told me that a year ago, I probably wouldn't have believed you, I probably would have just laughed at you. Uh, but a lot can change in a year. And the last 12 months have been pretty heavy. We've had increasing inequality, intense political and cultural polarization, conflict and unexpected political outcomes, and more surveillance and control. And in the middle of all this, actors emerging who are eager to take advantage of the change and uncertainty that we're experiencing. And the most effective tool that they have to exert large-scale influence and manipulation is the internet. Now, I first got involved in this, in this question, this problem last year, when I moved to New York to run my company. Scout.ai, it's a media company that focuses on the social impacts of technology. And I was living there uh, in the home of Trump Tower when the US election took place. So the circumstances around the election itself already seemed kind of suspicious to me because we knew that Russia had tried to hack into the DNC. Um, so I started connecting with political researchers and technologists because I was trying to learn more about what had actually gone on. And that's when I first came across the work of Jonathan Albright. So Jonathan had scraped the web and at he'd put together a map of news sites that were publishing during the election and how they were all connected. And what he found is there, there was actually a whole shadow network of alt-right and uh, Russian propaganda and fake news sites, including Breitbart News. And these, this shadow network was publishing hundreds of links to one another. And they were doing that because that made it able for them to game search engine optimization. So, you can see around the edges of the map here, uh, those are the sha that's the shadow network that you're seeing. And so what that meant is that any time bad news came out about Trump, these sites would publish their own spin on the story or another attack on his competitor. And within seconds, they could populate hundreds of additional automated links to one another. And the net effect is that, is that anyone who happened to be searching the web or trying to learn about the election in the US or either specific candidate would see the spin story ahead of any of the original news content. So talking to Jonathan about his research was the moment that I really first started to realize that this was going to be a really big story. And this was back in December. And I started to spend a lot of time hanging out in Brooklyn cafes. I was doing research, I was setting up VPNs, and I was constantly worrying about people hacking into my computer. And that research led me to a company called Cambridge Analytica. Now, Cambridge Analytica is a political messaging firm that was hired by the Trump campaign to run their online efforts. And over the course of the US presidential campaign, Cambridge Analytica put together personality profiles for every single US voter. And they used those personality profiles to run automated engagement scripts that cycled through 30 to 50,000 ads a day in key swing districts during the campaign. And because they used Facebook dark ads to do this, that means that they only show up in the feed of the people who were being targeted, uh, which means that they were able to skirt the regulatory eye of the Federal Elections Commission. Now, it's no accident that the biggest donor to Trump's campaign and the largest investor in Cambridge Analytica and one of the other largest investors in Breitbart News are the same person. And Cambridge Analytica was actually using that shadow news network that we talked about earlier to track who was clicking on which ads and to improve their ad targeting to those personalities. And one of the people that I talked to to learn more about all of this as I was trying to figure out what was going on was a guy named Samuel Woolley. Sam is the head of the Oxford Computational Propaganda Project. 
And he and his colleagues have been tracking how the internet has been used to spread misinformation for the last 10 years, since they start, first started noticed that this was happening during the Arab Spring. And over the years, they've actually built up a network of sources who are working on these things, they're building different parts of this, and those sources help them understand what they're seeing online. So Sam brought me up to speed on a related but separate trend, uh, which is armies of bots that are being used to manipulate and shape online conversations to create large shifts in public opinion. So individuals and governments around the world are actually creating hundreds and thousands of fake social media profiles that they're farming out to the highest bidder. And what that means is that around the world campaigns are using these to do things like magnify the voices of the political candidate so that they appear more popular than they really are. They're using them to comment on high profile news websites like the New York Times and the Washington Post to help skew the conversation around significant news stories. Um, they're using them to colonize the hashtags of their opponents um, and to create doubt about their personal and professional life. Um, and they're also using them to silence and intimidate journalists slash anyone who might you know, have an opinion or be critical of their candidate. So in the last few weeks of the US presidential campaign, both sides of the aisle were, were using bots. But uh, as Sam told me, Trump bots outweighed Hillary bots by a factor of five to one. And now when we look at these technologies, it's really important to remember that none of this is illegal. They're actually like just really great advertising techniques that are now being applied to politics. Um, and many of them have actually been used individually to some effect before. But together, they make up a nearly impenetrable voter manipulation machine. And by leveraging automated emotional manipulation alongside these armies of bots, alongside Facebook dark posts and fake news networks and A-B testing, actors all over the world are now able to tap into this weaponized AI propaganda machine to prey on the personalities of individuals and to create large shifts in public opinion. Now, Cambridge Analytica has already been hired to, to run messaging for the White House, um, and they're now targeting elections in India and Kenya and Australia and all across South America because data, personal data protections there are very lax. And Breitbart actually recently, earlier this year, opened offices in France and Germany because they wanted to try and influence those elections. And candidates in Mexico and Brexit and other, you know, dozens of other countries all over the world have all used these bot armies to try and help them win their campaigns. Now, in China, there's something kind of related but slightly different going on, which is that in China, the government has instituted uh, a system called Sesame Credit, which gives every Chinese citizen a score based on their social media postings and their known associates and their purchases, actually, which means that, you know, if you, if anyone who does something or says something or associates with someone or buys something that could be construed as anti-China can now be barred from getting on a plane and take, leaving the country or taking public transportation. And that system is voluntary now, but by 2020, it's going to be mandatory. So this problem really isn't going away by its, on its own anytime soon. And that's because the economics of the internet are really now biased towards monopolization. I talked about China earlier because China and Silicon Valley are two for, like the two centers of gravity that are really driving the future of the internet. And in China, the top priority is surveillance and citizen control. Whereas in Silicon Valley, investors are demanding monopoly business models that are built on habit-forming products. These are hard incentives at the root of the new internet. And until policymakers and industry leaders change the game, these forces will continue to be destructive to democracy. Silicon Valley spent the last 10 years building digital addiction machines. You, things like phones and apps and platforms. And in 2017, political parties and nation states all over the world learned how to hijack them, or they built their own platforms. So, what do we do about this? It seems like kind of a big problem. Um, 
one of the easiest things that you can do is to talk to your friends and family about the internet economics that are currently undercutting uh, democracy. If we are aware that our social media profiles are being used to manipulate our opinions, we are much less likely to be manipulatable ourselves. And for me, the result of all that sitting around in cafes doing research in Brooklyn was an article that I wrote called The Rise of the Weaponized AI Propaganda Machine. Now, it was read, my goal with that was to create a shareable object that anyone could use to help tell their friends and family what was going on here. Um, and it was read, it's now been read nearly 500,000 times. BuzzFeed wrote not one but two articles calling me a conspiracy theorist, which I take as a personal badge of honor. Um, and Tim Berners-Lee, who is the creator of the internet, cited the article as one of the three biggest challenges facing the internet in, his, in its 25th year anniversary post that he wrote. So the second thing that you can do is to reach out to policymakers. Because policy change is slow by nature, but there is an active and uh, really passionate group of leaders internationally, and particularly in Europe, who are working on solving this problem. As a result of Scout's work on this issue, I was invited this year to attend the Brussels Forum, which is a group of 250 plus global leaders, people like the President of Estonia and the Deputy Secretary General of NATO. And I went there to debate Sweden's former prime minister about whether or not the internet is a force for democracy. So when we started the debate, about 80% of people thought it was a force for democracy. But by the time that I'd shared with them everything that I'd learned this year, only 33% did. And while I am here talking to you, my co-founder is in Washington, D.C., briefing members of Congress and political strategists about the same thing. So here in Lithuania, this is especially important because, you know, but wherever we happen to live, our local lawmakers need to know about this just as much as the lawmakers in Washington, D.C. So my request to you is call their offices. Let's write them letters. Let's make appointments to talk to them about it because they can't fix what they don't know or don't understand. Now, the third thing that you can do is to make friends at tech companies. Because one of the best ways to create change within the companies that make up the, the architecture of the weaponized AI propaganda machine, companies like Facebook and Google, is through their employees. They love their employees, and their employees are generally really great people, and they want their employees to be happy. So I've watched again and again as Facebook has changed its public stance about the role that it plays to ameliorate its employees. Immediately after the election, Mark Zuckerberg came on, went on TV and categorically denied that Facebook had had any role in the election whatsoever. But after all the media and employee pressure mounted, he changed his tune. And in April, Facebook released an internal research report that found not only had the company been involved and been used for misinformation during the US election, uh, but they actually deleted 30,000 fake profiles ahead of the election in France. So if you have friends who work at tech companies, or if you work at a tech company, make sure that they understand how tech products are being weaponized to undermine democracy. Because not only will it help them to create better, more ethical products themselves, but it will give them the leverage that they need to start these kinds of conversations internally at their companies. Now, the last and the most important thing that you can do is to join the front lines building the next internet. Now, we're living through an unprecedented cyber attack on our freedom, on our democracy, and on our way of life. I came here to Vilnius a year ago. I learned that Lithuanians are constantly under attack. Civic infrastructure, your, your culture. Um, and at the time, Trump was still, at that time, a, a laughing stock, really, in the US. He wasn't taken seriously as a candidate. But I'm here today to let you know that we in the US are now activated. The U.S. intelligence community, the tech community, and citizens, they've, we've all woken up to the threat posed by Russia, by autocrats, and by private political empires that threaten our way of life. And it's time for us, collectively, to build a new alliance that's dedicated to the creation of a truly democratic internet. Because together, we can create a new internet. Thank you. <laughs>